I want to welcome you here. My name is Scott, and I'm the pastor here at Sunlight. Uh, tonight, we've been singing about and uh, hearing about the facts of uh, Jesus' birth, that uh, angels came and sang, that shepherds came and attended, that he was born in a lowly stable. Uh, but beyond that, uh, our aim tonight is to talk about the meaning of Christmas and why it was that God became a man. And um, there's this phrase, Emmanuel, which in Hebrew means God with us. And tonight, I'd like to invite you to consider why that was important. Why is it important that God took on human flesh and became a man? I'd like to begin tonight with Matthew chapter 1. Uh, here's the account. An angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. Now, for those of you who don't know this, in Greek and in Hebrew, the name Jesus means the Lord saves. The angel explained, because he will save his people from their sins. The passage goes on. It says, all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. So this baby was to be Emmanuel, God with us. Uh, why Emmanuel? Why is that important? And uh, tonight I I'd like to give three reasons why this is such an important thing, why it's literally changed the world. The first reason is simply this, that God intended through the birth of Jesus to communicate his message to us. Now, um, I don't know if you know this, but Jesus often when he taught spoke in parables and taught in parables. Parables are just a simple story that have a much more profound and deep uh, meaning. And tonight, as we talk about these three points that I intend to bring up, uh, I too would like to uh, teach in parables. And um, three parables, in fact, the first one actually comes from a man named Paul Harvey. I don't know if all of you remember Paul Harvey on the radio, a radio broadcaster. This is the parable of the birds. And it goes like this. There uh, was a man whose family on Christmas Eve, the family came to him and begged him, please go with us to church. And um, the wife came, the children came, but uh, the father, as he considered everything, the man said, listen, it's unreasonable to think uh, what Christians say, that God would become a man. Uh, if there were a God, that wouldn't be the kind of thing he would do. It's just unreasonable. And uh, I can't go and be a hypocrite uh, please just go without me. I'm going to stay here at home. And so he waved goodbye, and his family went off to church. After they left, uh, a winter storm came up, and he settled down for the night in his favorite easy chair by the fireplace. Uh, soon the snow was blowing uh, very mightily. A big blizzard came, and uh, as he was there reading his paper, all of a sudden he heard a noise, thud. Then there was another noise, thud, thud, thud. And he realized what was happening. On one wall, they had a large landscape window, and there was a number of birds who, because they were discombobulated from the great storm that had arose, had come, and they were hitting that window as they were seeking shelter from this terrible storm. He got up from his chair, he went over to look, and he decided he had to do something. And so he, he got on his winter coat, he got on his boots, he bundled up, put on a scarf and mittens and a hat, and he, he walked outside and thought, now, how can I save these birds? He had an idea. There was a, a barn that was his barn nearby. He went over, he threw open the doors and uh, turned on the light and uh, he called to the birds, birds, come to the barn, of course. The birds had no idea what he was saying and so uh, they just became more confused and were beating around in the snow. Finally, he got a bright idea. He went back into his house. He got a loaf of bread. He came back outside, and he made a trail of breadcrumbs from the place of the birds all the way to the barn, thinking, surely they'll see this trail of crumbs and follow the way. But of course, the birds, not being hungry at the time and fearing for their life, uh, they didn't move at all. He became desperate. He thought, what shall I do? He finally decided he would get behind the birds, so he, he moved. He got behind the birds, and he started to shoo them, shoo, and he was waving his arms and starting to shout. Uh, he was thinking, of course, they'll move away from him and move toward the barn, but the more he waved his arms, the louder his voice grew, the more confused they got. And at that moment, 
As the parable goes, the man had a thought. He thought to himself, if only I could become a bird. Then I could speak in a language that they'd understand. Then I could approach them in a way that would make sense to them. And as Paul Harvey tells it, at that moment, the church bells began to sound, ringing out the Christmas song, O Come All Ye Faithful. And the man understood for the first time what Christmas was all about. You see, Christians believe that God became a human being because he wanted to communicate himself to us. Hebrews chapter 1 says this of Jesus, in the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son. So this passage is saying God intends to speak to us through Jesus. This passage goes on to say this, the Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of God's being. How could our feeble minds, limited as they are, how, how could we, people, as limited as we are, comprehend and understand the God who, through the vastness of the universe, created everything there is, setting all the stars, how could we possibly comprehend Him or understand Him? The Christian message is simply this, that God became a human so that he could communicate to us his message. The second reason why Emmanuel, God intended to demonstrate his love for us. Here's the second parable of the night. It comes from a famous philosopher, Immanuel Kant. He uh, told the story uh, of a great king. This king uh, was a, a king who had a prince, and uh, the prince uh, was uh, great in power. He ruled over a large, large land. He was very, very wealthy, and the prince uh, came of age and was looking for a spouse. Uh, this prince, uh, of course, lived in the castle, had all the wealth, had all the power, and um, as princes sometimes do, fell in love not with a, a princess, but a poor maiden who ha had nothing and was only dressed in rags. But uh, he was head over heels for her, there was nothing that could turn his heart away, and he just had to win her love. So he called all his advisors together and says, what shall I do? Uh, there's such a distance between us. How shall I win her love? The advisors gathered together, they had a great thought, and they came to the prince and they said, listen, here's what you'll do. You'll order her to love you. You're the king, you can have people do whatever you want, you simply go to her and say, you must love me. And uh, because you're so powerful, of course, she, she'll obey. The prince thought it over, and uh, as he mulled it over, he realized that he, he did have the power to order her to do whatever, but he realized she may come, she may live in the castle, she may feign love, but no outside force can crack open the heart. That's only something that can come from within. And he was vexed over the whole thing and said, I don't know, that's not the way to get someone to love me. So he thought and he thought, finally called his advisors together and says, you'll have to come up with a better plan. So they put their heads together and they came up with what they thought was a better plan. They said, listen, prince, here's what you do. You are wealthy beyond all measure. You simply need to shower her with gifts and riches, lavish upon her a much greater life than she could have ever imagined. Then she'll truly love you. But as the prince thought over the new plan, he realized there was a problem. She may, in fact, respond to all the gifts. She may, in fact, respond to the better life. But would she, in fact, love him or only the gifts and things he was giving to her? And thinking the whole thing over, he finally realized there was only one thing to do. He took off all his princely robes. He set aside his crown. He put on rags. And in order to win her love, he went and lived as a pauper. And uh, he realized that was the only way that if she would respond to him, that he might truly win her love. And um, that's what God has done for us as well. Of course, he's God. He could order us, love me. He could make us do so. But would that be love? 
Or he might shower with every kind of rich and blessing and, and give us everything we could have ever imagined. But would we love God for him or for his things? So what God did is he set aside all of his majesty. He took on our humanity. And the idea was simply this, to demonstrate his great love for us. Matthew chapter 10 puts it this way. For the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. There's a third reason why Emmanuel, and it's simply this, God took on human flesh to save people from their sins. We read it in Matthew chapter 1. The angel told Joseph to give this child the name Jesus. The name Jesus means the Lord saves. And ultimately, the reason for Emmanuel is that God intended to save us from our sins. Just a few comments and then the parable. If you read the Old Testament, there are a few things that become absolutely clear. One of the things that becomes clear is this, that God has a standard for our lives. Of course, most of us here know the Ten Commandments. Another thing becomes clear if you think about those Ten Commandments, we don't live up to them. We all know that. We don't live up to that standard. And uh, the Bible makes plain, and if you read the Old Testament, you'll see this, that if we don't live up to God's standard, there's a consequence, there's a punishment. But, and here's what the Old Testament tries to get across, God intended to provide a substitute, a sacrifice. In fact, if you read the Old Testament, it's one of the primary features of the Old Testament, animal sacrifices. Uh, in fact, it's gory. In fact, many of you, if you read the Old Testament, you say to yourself, boy, I don't like to read that because it's just, it's gory. There's one death after the next, animal after animal after animal, lamb after lamb, sheep after sheep, goat after goat, cow after cow. It's just, there's a bloody mess of sacrifice after sacrifice after sacrifice. And here's the message. No animal can take our place. We all know what justice is. You've heard the phrase, he who does the crime does the time. Justice won't allow another creature to suffer for what we have done. And so only human beings can pay the price, but no mere human being could bear the weight of our sin, only a, a human being who is also at the same time God. Which leads now to the third parable. It's a parable, by the way, that is adapted from a, a, a TV series called The Millionaire from the 50s and 60s. It's the parable of a man named John Bennisford Tifton. And uh, here's his story. Uh, John Bennisford Tifton was a man from a faraway land who, who grew very wealthy in his life. I mean, not the kind of wealth that you and I have greed for. Uh, wealth that's just silly. I mean, he had the most unbelievable wealth, the most unbelievable money at his, his uh, disposal. Uh, our greed doesn't even match what he finally owned, and he finally decided to do this, give it away. And so uh, $10 million at a time, he decided he was gonna change one life at a time. He had a, a trusty servant, and uh, this is what he'd do. He, he'd put together $10 million in a briefcase. He'd send his servant out, and that servant would go find a person and, and tap him on the shoulder and give him that money and change his life forever. Uh, can you imagine what it's like to get $10 million? Uh, one thing that happened to every single person who received one of these briefcases, their life changed forever. And, um, okay, this is a picture of you or I if we got that briefcase uh, right now. Here's what happened. Uh, at first it was one person, then it was two, then it was three, then it was four, then it was five. Then it was six, then it was seven, then it was eight, then it was nine. Finally, there was a dozen, then two dozen, then three dozen. Then there was a hundred, then there were hundreds. Finally, there was a thousand. His money uh, seemingly never running out. He always had more, and upon his death, he, he left instructions in his estate to all the descendants of his, 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 his trusty right-hand man. Their job was to take from his estate and continue to touch lives. And so uh, life after life, there were finally thousands upon thousands of people who received briefcases filled with $10 million each. And what finally happened is uh, those whose lives had been changed forever decided that uh, they would throw a party once a year honoring the mem memory uh, of Tifton. They would gather together. There were uh, songs that were written. There were poems that were read. 
there were memories that were shared uh, of what a great and benevolent man this was. Uh, they would most often tell stories of his great generosity and benevolence. Uh, finally, one day, years and years later, two of these Tifton receivers decided to take a trip and uh, they came to uh, the United States of America, arriving in New York City. And as they were arriving, they were there on Tifton Eve, the day before the birthday of this great man that they honored. And as they got off the boat, they said, wouldn't it be great if here in the United States we could find someone and celebrate with them as we celebrate the birthday of Tifton. And uh, they walked the streets of New York and were soon pleased to see that uh, there was a great big sign in one of the department stores Tifton Day. Uh, they walked in the department store and uh, they saw there were many people who uh, seemingly were in a festive mood and they thought, for sure we found somebody to honor the memory of Tifton with. And they walked up to the cashier who said, Mary Tifton. And uh, they said, oh, you must know Tifton. You must have gotten $10 million. No, I've never gotten $10 million. Uh, they walked a little further. They were asking more people. No one uh, who seemingly was celebrating Mary Tifton Day knew anything about the man. There were, there were signs that said, half off sales. They discovered there was such a thing as a Tifton tree, kind of tree that wasn't even around in the country in which Tifton was born. There was even a line of holiday greeting cards called Tifton Cards. Uh, they couldn't believe it, but, but they couldn't find anyone who knew Tifton. They were asking more and more people, and uh, suddenly they, they, they just became distressed. And everyone seems to, to know the name, but no one seems to know who he is or what he's done. Finally, because they were asking so many people, they were invited to a Tifton party. They decided to go, hoping to meet someone who actually had received the, the $10 million and uh, they got there and found that there was a lot of partying, but no one who knew Tifton. In fact, they went up to one person. They said, did you receive $10 million? The person said, $10 million? I went into debt just to buy these Tifton presents this year. They asked another person, uh, do you know Tifton? They said, Tifton, that's just a tradition. I, I don't know who he is, but uh, we've been doing it ever since I was a young boy. They asked a third person, uh, do you know Tifton? They said, listen, here in America, we know something. We're much more skeptical. We're, we're much more thought-oriented. We're reasonable people. There's no such person as Tifton. We've gotten beyond that. We're so much more scientific and reasonable and rational now. Uh, there's no such person named Tifton. Uh, they were sad. When all of a sudden, a doorbell rang, and uh, there was a man holding a briefcase, and uh, for that moment, they said, finally, uh, the person's here. We're going, to, we're going to see now who Tifton is all about. The doorbell rang. They opened the door. Uh, they walked, the, the, the man with the briefcase walked in. He, he called out, excuse me, excuse me, but the people were so busy partying and celebrating that they barely heard them at all. The man with the briefcase actually walked up and, and, and tapped a person on the shoulder and uh, when the person turned around, they said, uh, listen here, looks like uh, you're some kind of business person and we're on holiday. This is no time to think about anything serious. Please leave. So the man carrying the $10 million slowly walked out and all those who were celebrating the memory of Tifton on Tifton Day never even knew the true gift that could be theirs. And um, if at all you catch the moral of this story, then you realize that it's got something of a downer message. It's possible to have Christmas trees, Christmas cards, Christmas cookies, Christmas lights, it's possible to celebrate Christmas and go to parties and have all the festivities, but not even know what it is those who have received the gift celebrate. See, why Emmanuel? Jesus came to pay a tremendous debt, to, to give us a gift 
that is of unestimable worth. And any who are willing to receive this gift, who will put their faith in Jesus and surrender their life to him, they too can have this gift that the riches of which there is no limit. And uh, for those three reasons, that God wants to communicate himself to us, that he wants to demonstrate his great love by giving us a gift of endless worth, the total forgiveness of sins so that we can be with God. And um, it's for that reason that we're gathered here together tonight. To set aside all the festivities, they're great. To recenter ourselves on the meaning of Christmas. To celebrate that there's a light that has come into this world to, to drive out darkness. And so in just a moment, we're going to share candlelight with one another. We're going to stand on our feet. We're going to sing together the song Silent Night. Just a few instructions. I'm about to say a prayer. Uh, I'll light the candle. Um, there'll be those who, who come and bring the light to you. If um, you're receiving the light, please tip your candle. If you have the light, please don't tip yours or else hot wax will go on your neighbor. Um, we don't want that to happen. Uh, so those of you who don't have the light, please tip your candle. At the conclusion of the service, uh, there's receptacles where you can place your candles. But at this time, I'd like to offer a prayer, and then we're going to, together, just in the quietness of the moment, center ourselves on the true meaning of Christmas, what it means that Jesus is Emmanuel. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you came to communicate yourself to us so that we can understand you and know you. We thank you that in Jesus Christ you've demonstrated your great love. That you set aside the riches and glories of heaven to be born in a manger to, to win our love. We thank you that you came to rescue us, to give us a gift of inestimable worth, that we might be freed from our, our debts and our sins, be brought back into your presence. Uh, we thank you for that, and as we light candles now, uh, we want to remember your goodness and, and your grace to us, and we pray all this in, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, amen. There's a responsive reading, I'll serve as the leader, and I ask that you respond. We look for light, but all is darkness. We walk in deep shadows. See, darkness covers the earth and thick darkness over the peoples. Nations will come to your light and kings to the brightness of your dawn. The sun shall no longer be your light by day, nor will the brightness of the moon shine on you. <laughs> 